So now we're going to talk about 2D flows. I think this is chapter five of Strogatz. We're thinking of a 2D vector field, 2D ordinary differential equations. You might think of it initially as this. We have an X variable and a Y variable. They both evolve. They're both real. X dot is F of X and Y. Y dot is some other scalar function. If we combine these two into a vector, and for now I'll put X with an underscore, just to remind ourselves this is a vector. And then F would be a vector, F underscore, so F a vector. Then this is the same as X dot equals F of X, where X is in R2. So this is a, we say this is a field of vectors at each x and y point, so let's say at this point, x, y, I've got a vector based at that point. Here's x dot, here's y dot. The x dot component is a function of x and y, it's f, and the y dot component is also a function of x and y. At nearby points, the vector won't change much, but let's say I go down to this point. Now that base point, I don't know, it could be pointing in an entirely different direction have different magnitude and all that. So this collection of vectors, think of the plane covered in little vectors, is a vector field. We will typically assume that f is a well-behaved function for us to have existence and uniqueness, but there'll be some new things that show up because we're in two dimensions that weren't there in one dimension. So we're going to assume that f and its derivatives with respect to x and y are continuous. That means f is continuously differentiable. And I'm not going to belabor points about existence and uniqueness, but if you have this, then solutions of x dot equals f of x exist and are unique. So uniqueness has new implications in 2D. Let's say weren't there before. So if I've got a point like I drew up there, out of each point is just one vector. And if I were to follow that solution, think of this as an initial condition. And then I were to follow what the path does, solving that um, two-dimensional ordinary differential equation. I'll have this thing, the trajectory going somewhere. Well, I don't know, maybe it'll do things like that. At each point, it's actually tangent to the vector field. Okay. And you can't have situations like, if, here's, a, here's a point. That's my vector. So I've got something coming through there. I can't have another trajectory passing through pointing in another direction. That would violate uniqueness. You can't pass through the same point, you know, transversely intersect. So that means trajectories cannot cross. Strange things might happen near fixed points. You can have fixed points and you would have trajectories that, let's say this is a stable fixed point. And I would have things that, uh, might have traject more than one trajectory approaching this. They never quite get there. If you have a stable fixed point, you never actually get there. You asymptotically approach it. So if I were to say take, you do equal time hash marks, then this these would just start accumulating. I wouldn't ever quite reach that point. So you could have fixed points, and fixed points might if you plot things might look like things are crossing, but they're not actually crossing. They're actually slowing down and stopping. So trajectories cannot cross. Um, oh, and we also have the possibility. Let's say we have a point. There's an, some initial condition. We have something that comes back onto itself. That's possible. So if we have something that goes back onto itself, what does that mean for initial conditions? that are inside. So now we have an inside and an outside. This thing would be a periodic orbit because for it to come back onto itself, it has to do that in a periodic fashion. It can't 
you know, take, do the first lap quickly and do the second lap slowly. It does the same amount of time every time it goes back and come back to the original point. But what is the possible fate for an initial condition inside? Does anyone have any thoughts? Where could it go? It won't be able to exit the con closed contour. Yeah, that's true. It, it won't because it can't cross. So what might it do? Thoughts on what it might do? Also oscillate? You're thinking this one could also, would also go back onto itself. That's a possibility, yeah. It's not the only possibility. It's probably not even the most general. Any other thoughts where this could go? So one thing is it could asymptotically approach that closed contour. It'll never quite get there, but it could asymptotically approach it. If you looked at the distance between the green curve and the blue curve, I mean, that's getting smaller and smaller, right? Because the green curve also can't intersect itself. You might have a situation where maybe there's a fixed point in here and everything is sort of spiraling into that fixed point. Back, no matter where I started, I would kind of spiral into that fixed point. But yeah, they can't cross. That was kind of the main thing is things can't cross. And so that leads to some implications like anything outside. Um, maybe it's going to you know, asymptotically approach this or maybe not. Maybe things will just go away and go up to infinity. And we'll look at criteria for what it leads to something like this, a closed contour or periodic orbit. Periodic orbits can exist, which means oscillations, which separate parts of the plane. Let me look at an example just to get us going. And it's the same example from before. I kind of think of a marble inside a hula hoop. So I think of a bead in a hoop, right? The bead in the rotating hoop. We originally formulated it as a two-dimensional differential equation. Remember when we did non-dimensionalization, we had, this is a second order ODE because the highest derivative is second order. We will turn it into two first order ODEs. From our first lecture, we called that a two-dimensional system. The first thing we might do is move this epsilon over to the other side. So we've got one over epsilon. And we define V as being d theta d tau. So that makes this thing equal to V, and then this is dV d tau. So in some sense, this definition also gives us our first ODE. We treat V as a variable. We rewrite the second order ODE. What do we get there? D V D tau is one over epsilon minus V minus sine theta plus gamma sine theta cosine theta. And now it's a first order ODE. And this definition, we just rewrite it as D theta D tau equals V. And now we have something that looks like um, if we treat, if we write this as d theta d tau equals f of theta and v, d v d tau equals g of theta and v. This is in the form that we introduced above. If you want, instead of um, theta, put x, instead of v, put y, and it looks the same. And the first, uh, you know, F is just V, so it's particularly easy. So we could even try to sketch what the vector field is, theta, and yeah, theta is, um, this thing is periodic in the theta direction, so that's nice. We're not going to use that necessarily yet, but for now, let's think of, um, let's pick points along the V axis and just plot some vectors. So if we were to pick this point, the horizontal component is d theta d tau is v. So the horizontal component is gonna be like that. And 
the vertical component is this over here. Theta is zero along the v-axis. So we've got um, negative v over epsilon. So we actually have a vector pointing down. And if we take some other point that's closer, this will be smaller pointing down. At zero, we have zero. For negative v, this reverses. Right? The horizontal component, it being v, is now pointed in the negative direction. And negative epsilon, negative v, is now pointing up. So we have a vector pointing upward over here. Again, let's say twice as big and twice as tall. Got a bigger vector. So that's just the vectors along one line. You could do the vectors at other locations and you will can kind of figure out what they'll do. Uh, so we've got vectors there. If you could kind of see what's going on, this seems to be forming a cycle or something. I don't know what it'll do necessarily. <clears throat> it depends on our parameters, gamma and epsilon, but this is just sort of giving you an idea. The overall goal, and this is overall, if you were to study a two-dimensional system, is figure out, determine all of the qualitative features of the trajectories. And determining all the qualitative features of the trajectories, this is also called finding the phase portrait. Or in a two-dimensional system, that means the phase plane. So this is figuring out everything that could happen and then plotting a representative set of trajectories. So plotting the vector field is not the same as getting the phase portrait. Getting the phase portrait would be for gamma less than one. So this is small rotation for the bead on the rotating hoop, plus or minus pi. The top of the hoop is unstable and the bottom of the hoop is stable. So trajectories are near here, they're spiraling in. And near these unstable fixed points, it's, it's not terribly obvious what will be happening, but these are actually saddle points. So there's directions where things are approaching and directions where things are leaving. And of course, these are asymptotic. They're not actually crossing that point. It just is, they look like they are. And how am I doing this? I know that everything below here is V, is d theta d tau. So for something that has positive d theta d tau, it has a component moving to the right. And for negative d theta t d tau, the vector has the component is moving to the left. So I think I may have done one of these wrong. Yeah, probably this one and this one. Yep. So there. I need to remind myself of my own rules. So we have that as kind of an idea. Filling it all in would then reveal the, the entire phase portrait. So there'd be something kind of coming out of there. There'd be some other trajectory kind of winding in, blah, blah, blah. And then this thing would go up there and so on. You don't need to plot every trajectory, but you plot a representative number that you can see what's going on. Here, everything will eventually end up at the bottom position, if we were to plot what the hoop is looking like. There's an upper position. Everything ends up at this lower position. All initial conditions lead here. For gamma greater than one, the origin become goes unstable and then there's two fixed points, remember, on either side of the origin. The top part is still unstable, but now we get something that will, will look somewhat weirder. Things will be Going that way, going that way. Something will be happening here. And we could just sort of sketch right there. So now there's actually two different states you might end up in. And it sort of depends on which and where your initial condition was, which of the two final states. So you might end up in this left side, the yellow, or the right side, uh, the purple. And it depends on not just initially what your theta is, but what your theta dot is. 
And that'll lead us to a discussion of you know, basin of attraction. Like maybe if you start up here, at the right, the right point, you'll kind of go around, maybe oscillate back here and then actually settle down. I guess I plotted this as opposite. These are fixed points. So we'll stop there and then continue with 2D flows next time.